motivated me. Um, so it's kind of that search for understanding myself and also understanding why I'm here and how to make the best use of my life that took me to India. So it was sort of from going to, from a small town to a huge ancient culture, which I mean, I could have spent the rest of my life there. It's so fascinating to sort of see the whole of humanity, like, yeah, not covered up, you know. In England, we sort of live behind closed doors. Life and death is very much a private affair, but in India, it's, it's all there, you know, to see. Um, and that was kind of a wake-up call. But also, I saw that people had a sense of meaning in their life, um, perhaps from the most basic level of survival, you know, but also up to a, a higher spiritual level. Um, and people seemed to have a sense of something that was bigger than their own kind of egoistic concerns. Um, whereas in, in the West, you know, we can be so hung up on small little things that are actually quite trivial compared to sort of basic survival. <laughs> um, so yeah, I heard about um, meditation while I was there. And I knew nothing about Buddhism, but I just heard that there were these retreats you could do. For, and for ten days you could be with yourself, in silence, just you and your mind and your body. And uh, I just thought, wow, that would be so fascinating to see what would actually happen if I was just alone with myself in that way. So I was really interested in the psychology of it, you know, would I kind of follow my tendencies and get into deeper and deeper kind of distress, or would the mind kind of finds some kind of inner resource and strength. So, uh, yeah, I did my first 10-day retreat, and um, there were no special experiences on it at all. Um, and it was very clear that that wasn't the aim of it in any way. But what I did get from it was understanding the interaction between the mind and the body, and how we're constantly reacting to sensations in the body. Um, and we feel it's about the things outside, you know, so you may meet somebody that you don't like and you're not quite sure why, but when you bring it back to the physical experience in the body, often you can find that it, it's a reaction to the way someone makes you feel, actually. You're not reacting to the thing outside, you're reacting to the sensations and the experience within. So this method was very much focused on, you know, being aware of the experience and also noticing how it changes. Uh, it was a, a retreat by Goenka, you may have heard of S.N. Goenka, he teaches Vipassana courses. And um, you really learn that the sensations can be pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, but how you observe them is kind of key to, to the way you create your reality. Um, and when you see that they're changing all the time and you're able to open to that, the reactivity goes away. So this was really fascinating to me, and it gave me that sense of, ha, this is a tool that I can now use for the rest of my life. And I knew from then that this would be for life, you know. So I spent... I'm, I'm making this quite long, aren't I? <laughs> but I spent the next... Um, <laughs> I spent the next uh, seven years or so in India, mostly, trying to figure out how to kind of make enough money to come back and continue to meditate and also served a lot on retreats and I think that was, it was the serving that really helped me integrate the practice with my everyday life. So um, I'd sit a 10 day course and then I'd serve one because all the retreats run on donations so even the volunteers there are just, they don't get any remuneration, they just serve. And, uh, and during the service you got the chance to you know, see the way that the practice would affect the way you then related to others. That was one really key thing, and also to develop gratitude, you know. But the other thing I think the service helped me with was to see how we are all the same. And human beings have like a range of experiences and emotions that they go through, but it's kind of, there's only a certain range. And all of us experience it, you know, every kind of emotion at some stage. And this was really helpful to come out of that sense of, oh, I'm suffering. And it must be because there's something wrong with me, you know, or nobody else feels this way. And, you know, the kind of feelings that actually consolidate suffering, you know, the sense of isolation and being alone with it and no one else understanding. I realised that, no, actually, it's human experience, it's nature, and everybody goes through similar things. So that really opened up a sense of compassion, you know, for the human predicament, really. Um, 
and yeah, I just found it a very meaningful way to live, and it really changed my life. So during all these years, I, the aspiration to ordain was increasing in me. Not because I felt like I need to have a, an external appearance or be part of a religious group or anything like that. I was quite uninterested, actually. Um, but perhaps in that society and in that context, it seemed quite a natural thing to do because there's this understanding that you can practice as a lay person or you can practice as an ascetic, so as a homeless person, somebody who's gone forth from the home, from the home life. So this is still a very, um, a very big concept in Indian society. Um, so I had this very strong aspiration that was deepening over over time, and then eventually I um, heard about my teacher in Burma, who was teaching a similar thing, and who ordained Westerners. Uh, and at the time I was actually studying Indian medicine. <laughs> in England because I'd kind of given up on finding a place, or at least temporarily given up. Um, so I heard about my teacher and I just knew I had to go there and, um, and ordain. So I did that in my holidays, my summer holidays, for three months. <laughs> and sometimes you just have this um, resonance with a teacher or with a, a place. or It felt so kind of meant to be, in a way. Um, so as soon as I graduated, much to my mother's horror, I think, <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I got a lot from the degree, but, um, you know, and it's a, it would have been a wonderful livelihood. So I didn't feel I was running away from anything, you know, I had everything, actually. I could have had a wonderful livelihood with Ayurvedic medicine, but um, I felt like, no, in this life, I just want to take the practice as far as I can. Um, and the conditions were there, so, so I ordained. And, uh, yeah, so I stayed there for about four years with my teacher. I got very sick, though, from the food and the climate and very poor nutrition, actually. Um, so I had to, yeah, I, I sort of left and came back several times trying to cure my tummy problem. Um, and in the end, it was interesting. I realised after a few years that... Um, that I needed to adopt a much, much softer approach with my practice. So we used to sit for hours at a stretch, which was fine, and it was a natural sort of progression, really, on the path, that the body became still as the mind became still, you know, and you could sit quite comfortably for long hours. Um, but when my health started to suffer, I felt that I just needed to learn to listen to it much more deeply and to be particularly gentle. Like, even though I didn't feel I was using a lot of tension or force, it wasn't as gentle as it could be. So I started to experiment with being really, really loving and kind and gentle with my body. And at that time, I got in contact with the teachings of another teacher called Ajahn Brahm, who's very well known globally, I would say. But I had no idea who he was. I just heard these teachings about being kind and gentle to yourself and really developing so much contentment with like every single breath, you know, which immediately took away any sense of having to get somewhere, you know, having to sort of, the path being linear at all, you know, um, and just realizing that right now we have the potential to be content just with one breath. And this was like, wow, so easy. Can it really be that easy, you know? And just from listening, I would, I would get so much joy coming up and, and sort of this instant contentment, which I think we have, but we often don't notice, you know, because we're so programmed to keep moving on <laughs> into the next experience or the next conversation, the next meal, whatever, even the next yoga posture, you know. But when you can really just be with that one moment, it was already, it's already so rich. So this really changed the way I practiced. And um, I had um, almost like a compulsion that I had to find this teacher. And uh, so I left Burma. And two years later, found my way to Australia to train with him. So my practice has changed a bit in that time. And I think the difference now with being with my experience is that in the past I used to be with the experience with a lot of awareness of impermanence, which is a wonderful tool for developing wisdom and a sense of non-clinging. And also equanimity was a really strong focus. So whatever you experience, to learn not to react 
to not generate negativity. Um, but with Ajahn Brahm, there's a very strong emphasis on um, kindness with every experience. So not only feeling the sensation and being aware, but being intentionally kind. So really looking at the relationship between the observer and whatever you observe. So it's like he talks about the gap between the two, the gap between the observer and the observed. Mm -hmm. And in that space, that space is the place that you have some degree of, I wouldn't say control, but influence. Mm -hmm. So you can fill that space with whatever is wholesome. And too often we fill it, you know, with craving or with a sense of uh, lack or with the hindrances that come up, like doubts or um, aversion, you know, disliking things or agitation. So instead of that, he emphasizes putting a lot of kindness in that space, even to those un unwanted mental states. So even if anger comes up, not okay, I have to, you know, be equanimous or I have to see that it's changing, but oh, anger, you know, you came to see me, you're most welcome, you know, what is it that you need at this moment, like what, how can I relate to you in a way that's kind, and it's so transformative when you start to get the hang of this, <laughs> it's really, <laughs> you know, because we're so programmed, aren't we, to kick it away straight away, oh, I shouldn't be angry, you know, we're conditioned, anger's bad. You know, if you're an angry person, well, if you have anger, you are an angry person, so you create an identity out of it. But, um, yeah, also that we shouldn't feel that. There's certain things, especially if we're a spiritual person, certain, certain things we should experience and certain things that are not spiritual, right? Yeah. And actually, that's just a concept. There is no should or shouldn't. These are human emotions. And what creates the change and the transformation is our relationship to them. So this has been very helpful in my practice. So, yeah, and I think it's something that can be used in any situation, any context, you know, because whatever we do in life, it's a relationship. Even if there's no one around, you have a relationship with yourself. You're always there, so. <laughs> yeah, so relationship with our food, with our yoga mat, relationship with tiredness. You know, relationship with our friends, it's all about relationship. And, uh, yeah. So this is sort of a summary of some of the things I've learned and, and uh, think some of the things that have helped me. Um, now I'm having a relationship with being a very busy person because uh, my teacher asked me to come to England, where I'm from, and to leave him <laughs> to develop a little monastery in England. So... Um, at the moment, my relationship is being mostly with the computer <laughs> and having a very heavy workload. Um, and I think what keeps me going with it, because I don't like computers and I don't like being so busy, especially as a non, I wanted a simple life. <laughs> and it hasn't been that simple. Uh, but there's a lot of letting go involved and a lot of, uh, actually a sense of gratitude being asked to serve. and. Um, and yeah, letting go into what's being asked of me, I guess. And there's something very beautiful about that that gives me a lot of inspiration and energy. Even when I should be completely flat out and exhausted, there's some kind of energy. I think it is inspiration that comes through. Because it's not about me, you know, it's about serving. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. I just got here from England last night, actually. And Jill picked me up from the airport after <laughs> a very long wait for my luggage to come through. <laughs> so it, it feels lovely to have arrived and to be in this context and um, have the chance to share a little bit. So, yeah, it's kind of a, an unexpected surprise for me. So, yeah. So if anybody would like to um, ask or you know, comment on anything, please do. Um, and then, yeah. Is there a teacher, um, I forget his name. But, Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, is he coming from a Buddhist tradition as well? Yeah, he, was, um, he started his meditation in, uh, in England in the 70s, or even the 60s. Um, 
And yeah, he started off with the practice mm -hmm. rather than with any philosophy. I think he'd read about Buddhism and he felt that, yeah, this fits. You know, it wasn't like he had to um, learn it, really. It was just like, this is what I feel and it's all here in the books and this just fits, you know. So then he did his first meditation retreat in England as a student um, and has a very natural... Um, I don't want to call it ability because I don't think it's about ability, but... Um, he had very deep meditation from the beginning um, and he got a lot of happiness from his practice. So that was what inspired him to ordain. It was the happiness. Mm -hmm. And he met different monks in England and he said, you know, out of all the monks he met, the Thai ones were the happiest. Maybe at that time, I don't know. <laughs> now, I don't think there's any law that says the Thai monks are happier. But <laughs> <laughs> at that time, he was quite inspired by them. So. Yeah, after graduating, he went to Thailand and trained with Ajahn Chah, who's the same uh, teacher as the monks here trained with. So there's a Bayagiri here. Jill goes there a lot. Ajahn Amaro. Ajahn Amaro. Mm -hmm. or treat, or, um, he was the co abbot of that monastery. Yeah. So, yeah, most of the monasteries, the Theravada monasteries in the West, are from that lineage. Um, but Ajahn Brahm was sent to Australia, which is a shame. He could have been sent to England, but he made a decision when he ordained that he would not go anywhere unless he was asked to. Uh, he would just completely give, give his life over, I guess, to his teacher and to serve in whatever way he was asked. So he made that commitment and uh, stayed there for about seven years before he was asked to go to Australia. So he's doing the same thing to me now. So. <laughs> Only I didn't get seven years with him. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Was he was he with Ajahn Chah when Ajahn Tamino was mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I don't know how long they overlapped for, but they did overlap. Yeah, they did. Ajahn Brahm was always very strong on the meditation side. I mean, they probably all were. It was quite a communal lifestyle as well. So they had chores and stuff in the mornings, and then would meditate in the afternoon. I think he was quite, I mean, this is my impression, I think he was quite um, introverted at that point. Mm. Um, and, yeah, just quietly got on with things. Yeah. And then was kind of, yeah, called to Australia to be in a, a leadership role, which he never really expected. But uh, he's doing brilliantly well, and now he teaches internationally, so... Yeah, but I think, you know, talking about motivation for monastic life, one of my main motivations was to be able to let go and to just be able to serve as asked. Because I saw that as a layperson, even though I was doing a lot of meditation and, you know, being in many centres, I still had a lot of control over it, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I just felt there was still... I was being led a little bit too much by what I felt like doing, you know, it was a bit too me-centred and I felt ready for the next level of... Um, I mean, you could call it surrender. We call it renunciation. Um, it is a kind of surrender, but it involves a lot of uh, discernment. You know, Like, no good teacher would ever ask you to sort of accept what they say and follow them, you know. Mm -hmm. You're really encouraged to, to find out, OK, is this... Does what they teach help me? Does it resonate with how they behave? Like, are they teaching one thing and behaving differently? Or is there some congruence there? You know? So you sort of need to live with a person for a long time to find that out. And then to really ask yourself honestly, is this helping me? Is this conducive? And if not, to, to change. So I've gone through a lot of different meditations, different... Um, I've met different teachers who've all helped me in different ways at different stages. So I think it's a very organic fluid process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else? Can you say more about the lifestyle itself? And yeah. What it means to be? Yeah, sure. Well, as a nun, it's quite different <coughs> from uh, how it is to be a monk because uh, I'm a fully ordained nun and there are, it's a very new thing within our tradition to give full ordination to nuns. <laughs> So we don't have much of a um, we don't have much of a tradition to really move into. We're sort of finding our way, in a sense. Um, so my lifestyle at the moment is very unpredictable. 
But if you do join a monastery, then the routine is uh, more or less sort of waking fairly early and then meditating alone or with the other people in the monastery, depending on the place. And then in the morning there'll be some kind of community work because all the monasteries are sort of um, managed and run by the community itself. So in Perth, when I was staying there for the last three or four years, um, we do a lot of uh, work on the, for on the fire breaks because in Australia there are so many forest fires, so we'd be out in the bush and doing, you know, maintaining the roads and making sure, you know, the leaves were not piling up too high, so back burning and and then monastery maintenance, so making sure the gutters are clear, uh, fixing any leaks, building walls, building roads, <laughs> really kind of, you know, down to earth stuff, which I think is great because you need to be sure, like I said before, spirituality is not something different from your life. You know, it has to be integrated into your life. So it's quite a grounding sort of practice and it's a good check to make sure uh, that, yeah, you're able to relate to others, you're able to work as part of a team, you know, you're able to endure some hardship as well because it can be hard work. And then we have our lunch. Um, and in Perth, we usually have a lot of people coming every day to offer food. So we have these alms bowls and we take our alms bowl and people put rice inside there. And then uh, we have like a big buffet spread so then you take your food. It's offered to the monastics, then we take our food. And then um, the abbot will usually give a little reflection or something or meet the visitors to talk about Dhamma. And, um, and then once we've tied it up, we basically go off to our little hut so we have a small residence, which is quite basic. We don't have electricity or... There was a tap, which was great, so we had running water. Um, and, well, we had 600 acres of forest in that monastery, which was just fantastic. So we go to our hut, or you could sit out in the forest as well and meditate. So it required quite a lot of independence in the meditation. There weren't too many teachings in our monastery itself, but we all have our little iPods with our favourite teachers. So I call that my pocket Ajahn, <laughs> She's my pocket teacher, <laughs> so I had all the talks there. So we really have our own schedule in the afternoon. And uh, yeah, the way we do it in Perth is not to have evening meetings. So if we want to have tea or something, we can go and get it from the kitchen, but we don't actually meet as a group to meditate, we meditate on our own. So there's a lot of free time, and some nuns study, they're really into the texts. Some nuns are really into the rules of discipline, so they study that in detail and compare it to earlier versions and look at all the background stories. Um, I tend to be more inclined towards uh, the teachings that directly feed into my practice. So I would study to some extent, but only in so much that it supports my practice. So I was more on the meditation side, I would say. And I love the nature, so I'd go out and find a rock. Lots of granite outcrops, and i find a rock to sit on. Usually above a river, or mm. near running water. Mm. And, um, yeah, it felt very... When I read some of the early Buddhist texts, I felt like I was almost in those days. Because it talks about, you know, the monks go on arms round in the morning, and the nuns. And then in the afternoon, they'd go out into the forest and... and you know, just sit somewhere delightful. They talk about it delighting the heart, you know, they find these beautiful craggy rocks and, and nature to sit in. And uh, it felt very much like that. Yeah. But safe, you know, because we had, it was all part of the monastery. So you knew no one was going to come by. Yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty much the schedule. And then once a year we have a rains retreat for three months in the, which is the summer here, but it's the winter in Perth. So like July to September or August to October, depending on the moon calendar. And that time, it's uh, there aren't any work meetings at all. We just uh, we meditate the whole day basically. So it's a time of more introversion and more practice time. And then a few nuns will be on a roster to just do the basic kind of cleaning duties. Yeah, but but much less. Um, much less work and, and less teaching outside the monastery. Yeah, Some nuns teach outside as well, to the lay people. So quite a simple life, but also um, um, 
some people think that it's running away or that you somehow avoid a lot of the problems that one might have in the lay life, like being busy or meeting difficult people, but you don't avoid that, <laughs> <laughs> especially in community, you know, because you're living with people you never chose to live with. Mm -hmm. They could come from any background, from any culture, of any age, so you're all very, very different. But I think it's helpful because the one thing that does connect you, like I said before, is the kindness. All our intentions are good, you know, we all have the same intentions to kind of purify our mind and, and find some meaning and some inner happiness. And, um, yeah, so kindness and um, just reflecting that we're all subject to old age, suffering and death, you know. We're all fragile and we're doing our best, so... Yeah. One of the really nice teachings that my teacher, sort of an advice really for community living is um, to always give people the benefit of the doubt. So no matter what happens, it's so easy to come to a, a conclusion, you know, or, or create an image or a judgment of that person. But he always says, you don't know, you don't know where they're coming from, you don't know what they're struggling with. Give them the benefit of the doubt, you know. Even if it seems like an obviously rude thing that somebody said, well, you know, maybe they're tired, maybe they didn't really mean it that way. You know. So always looking at ways to perceive situations and people in a way that doesn't create unnecessary suffering for ourselves and others. Because I think the other thing about community is when you suffer, people feel it. You know, When you're angry, people feel it. It's very, very delicate. So we have a real sense of responsibility to each other, You know, not to project onto each other and to realise when that starts to happen and to say, okay, can I really be sure about that, you know? Challenge your perceptions. Yeah, ways of looking. So there's some of the potentials, I think, of community life. Yeah. <laughs> can you uh, tell everybody a little bit about arms rounds? Arms rounds, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, arms round means um, basically going uh, with your arms bowl, which is like a, a begging bowl, you could say. And uh, sometimes it happens within the monastery, so you go with the bowl and people put food into it. And other times you may go out into the village and people get the chance to put food into your bowl. So this is quite a common practice in Asia, and it's a really beautiful practice because it's a, it's a reciprocal thing. And the Buddha said it's very important for monastics to go on arms round because it creates a, a connection between you and the people who support you. And also for the lay people um, who you teach, it creates this opportunity to come in contact with them, to be able to offer some teachings, and for them to be able to respond with support and to develop generosity, basically. Which I think is a very beautiful um, idea, because in the West we tend not to have that practice. We, we, you know, we are generous to our friends and whatever, but the emphasis is that one who is generous actually benefits oneself. Like, it's almost the foundation of the practice. And the Buddha said, you know, there are different motivations for giving, but the highest one is to beautify the mind. So to give for the sake of making the mind beautiful and making a really lovely base for developing, like, precepts and to live a harmless life that benefits others. So it's a practice for people to give to the monastics. And it's a practice for us to be able to receive. <laughs> That's one of the things I notice, actually, is that it's sometimes harder to receive than to give. You know, it can bring up lots of things. It can bring up feeling of, oh, do I deserve this? Or, oh, I'm not sure, like, I'm worthy, or these kind of things. And, and it's, it's really good to be able to reflect on that and realise, no, it's not about that. It's not about me, even. It's about another person having the opportunity to give. And it is quite humbling. Yeah. So for me, it, it helps me to, um, to go back in the afternoon and to develop a lot of gratitude and a sense of responsibility, in a way, to those who are supporting me. So there's a responsibility to practice well for, so that I can give back to them. But not in a way that's um, a guilt trip, you know. Just a sense of, okay, this is benefiting others too. It's not only for myself, it's for others. And I want to be worthy of this, you know. So it's a motivating factor, I would say, for the practice. Um, so, yeah, I have actually been on Arms Round in the West a few times. Earlier last year, I went to Lanzarote, <laughs> unexpectedly. It's an island off, uh, it's a Spanish island off the 
west coast of Africa. And uh, two of my friends were going there for a personal retreat and they invited me to go with them and to cook for me. They offered to cook for me for three weeks, which was such a treat, really. Um, and one day we thought, what about going on arms round, you know, in one of the little Spanish villages, just to see what happens. You know? yeah. It's not a Buddhist place, right? They don't necessarily have that tradition. Or, um, but there's a town called Aria, and that actually, in the Pali language, that actually means noble one. <laughs> And this town was called Aria, which was quite auspicious. So I thought, why don't, why don't we walk to Aria today and uh, go on arms round? So it was a nine-mile walk across volcanoes, because <laughs> it's a volcanic island, so all the mountains are, you know, on active volcanoes. Uh, so we walked there, you know, and uh, got there at about ten in the morning or so. And the whole place was kind of asleep. It was off-season, you know, middle of the winter. <laughs> And we stood outside this one shop, and uh, I was saying to my friend, there's no way we'll get anything, you know. I'm sure we won't get anything here. I'll probably have to go hungry. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, the lady from the shop came out, and she said, oh, um, she spoke Spanish, my friend understood, and she said, oh, I'm not sure if this is good for you to stay here, because this is a shop, you know, it's like a, a, a public shop, and you're standing here, and, you know, what will the customers think? I think, you know, please don't stand here. <laughs> And she was quite apologetic. She said, you know, it's my husband. She blamed it on her husband. It's my husband, you know, he feels a bit embarrassed and we're not quite sure how it looks. So um, she said, but there's an organic market further down the road. You can go and stand there. So I said, okay, no problem, you know, we'll go, we'll go there. So we went to stand outside this organic market and um, stood there for another half hour. Nothing happened. You know, people were going in and out of the shop and very few people. And I just thought, you know, nothing, we're not going to get anything. And then suddenly this man came out and he sort of looked at me and I thought, oh, he's noticed. And he came up to my arms bowl and very quietly and very humbly just put these bananas and these bread rolls into my bowl. And he said, thank you. And then he just walked off. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was so humbling and it was so beautiful the gesture that he made you know not asking he didn't need to know who we were he didn't need to find out what we were going to do with the food or anything um and he just gave it in that way and after that it was like a chain reaction people were watching you know and people who'd seen it thought oh let, why don't we have a go you know nothing seems to go wrong she doesn't bite or anything like that <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we have a go so a few more people came out and started putting things in my bowl until I needed to carry a bags, you know, because I didn't have any space in the bowl. And then the most amazing thing was that this woman came running from another street, running up to us, and she said, Oh, you're still here. I'm so glad you're still here. She said, I'm really sorry I had to send you away from the shop. I felt really bad about it. It was just my husband, you know, he felt embarrassed. And um, she said, are you vegetarian? I've got this and this and this. And she brought a big piece of cheese, avocados, tomatoes, a loaf of bread, like a whole meal, basically. And she'd run all that way back to find us. And it was just the most amazing experience, this whole, you know, thing. And it wasn't because I was desperate for the food. It was just seeing, like, how... If there's an opportunity for people to give, and it's an opportunity for people to be generous, they take it, you know? People take it. And it has this kind of knock-on effect. And people think, wow, that looks really nice. It looks like a nice thing to give. Why don't we do it? And it was just very, very moving. Later on, I, I found the same guy came past, the, the one who gave the bananas and the bread, and I said, what made you give, you know? Did you, have you been to Asia? Like, have you met monks and nuns? He said, no, but monastics are a universal symbol. Mm. Yeah, just said it's a universal yeah. symbol. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that spirit is still there even in, in Lanzarote. <laughs> yeah. So that was quite uplifting. Yeah, so how do, how do people know uh, to like, give you food? Are you having conversation with them or are you just oh, being silent or yeah. well that that's work? the interesting thing because you know they're not going to know that's why I asked him have you been yeah. to Asia because I wasn't sure how he knew um, <laughs> in that case it must have been intuitive for him I think 
Um, normally we don't say anything, so people approach us and maybe it's why it takes a while for people to approach because they're not yeah. quite sure. Some people ask, um, sometimes people give money and then we have to explain that we don't actually um, receive money as monastics. Yeah. And then they say usually, well, what do you want? Like, what, what do you want? What do you need? And, and then we say, oh, um, we're collecting for the day's meal, so something that we can eat for the meal. So that's uh, one way. But yeah, in the beginning we don't say anything, we just stand quietly and with the bowl and wait to see what happens. So it's quite, it's quite an interesting practice. I noticed for myself in Lanzarote, you know, a sort of sense of nervousness at first, feeling like a bit like, ooh, a bit conspicuous, you know, mm. what are people going to make of this? And then you sort of, it's a bit like how we did the standing yoga, you sort of just relax into it and relax into being there and after a while the sense of self starts to dissolve a bit and you feel more like, um, okay, I'm symbolising an ancient tradition, it's not me standing here, it's an ancient tradition, I'm here as a monastic um, for people to give to if they would like to. Um, and yeah, I, I tend to find it quite a quietening experience at that point. And um, I think people are attracted to the peace of it, you know, just seeing people standing. Especially if there are a couple of you, it's a little bit easier, I think, for people to relate to. When it's just one monastic, you might be just a, not, a real crackpot, you know, you might be just a really odd person. But when there's two or three, it's obviously, obviously you belong to some kind of um, order or lineage or something. So that makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. But I've been on arms round in England too, and we got offered quite a lot of money at first, and then people started to realise we we need food. And uh, this one lady came up, and when she realised we need food, she was like, "Oh, that's terrible! That's terrible! You need food! Oh dear, you don't have any food! Oh, what can I do? What can I do?" <laughs> and she really kind of felt so much sort of um, I don't know what you call it. It was kind of compassion, I guess, compassion on us. You know, they need to eat. They need something hot. <laughs> and she disappeared off in various shops. She said, please wait, please wait. And she came back with bacon sandwiches. <laughs> At the time I was vegetarian, actually. But <laughs> one of the things about being a monastic is that if people give in that way, it isn't right, it wouldn't feel right to say, sorry, you know, I don't take bacon. So, um, yeah, she figured it's bread, it's hot, it's something we can eat straight away. And... She was so delighted to offer it. So it was a very nice bacon sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> the first I've had since I was 19, I oh, think. Wow. <laughs> yeah, And lots of things happen. I went on arms round last year. I went on a two-dong. We call it a two-dong. It's like a walking pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. So I started quite close to my hometown, actually, which felt a bit strange, because I never identify that with having a lot to do with my other life. Um, <laughs> which is good to bring them together, you know. So I started walking from Bakewell, it's called, and uh, walked all the way to Manchester, which is, I don't know how many miles it is, but it was a, a week's walk, and along the way we, uh, we went on arms round. Um, you could say we cheated a little bit, because the friend that I walked with um, knew some people in the area, and she told them I was there, and so they felt like they wanted to come. And one couple actually came with a camper van with a little stove and they brought this food and heated it all up in the camper van. <laughs> <laughs> and we had this wow. yeah, hot meal en route, which was fantastic. They even carried my backpack, for actually, a couple of days and delivered it to where we ended up at the end of the day. Yeah, but we just camped out and then walked again the next day and uh, arrived at a Buddhist centre in Manchester. And I gave a, a talk, actually, in that centre. And, um, and at the end of the talk, there was a discussion between me and the other people who arrived. And um, three people at that talk ended up being on our project, on the monastery project. So one of them became a trustee, and two of them are now taking care of our Facebook page. <laughs> so this is how it's happened, really, since arriving in England. I've just started to meet people along the way, and... Just as we need someone for a certain job, someone will show up and say, I can do this job. And it, really? That's just what we needed, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Mm. It always feels like a little bit of a fluke. Like, okay, I'm making it today, who knows tomorrow. <laughs> but 
it's felt like that now for 21 or 22 years of my life. <laughs> and sometimes I ask myself, you know, when I get a bit nervous about the future, because we don't have savings or anything like that, or any pension or anything, you know. Um, and I ask myself, well, have I ever been hungry in my life? No, not really. Sometimes I've had to eat cheap food, you know, I've had 20 pence to spend on my meal in India, but I've always got something. Have I ever been on the street? No. At least I've had a tent or something. And, uh, yeah. So, who knows what tomorrow brings, but I think it, it makes me value each day, each moment, each person who becomes part of this journey. Um, and it feels very much like uh, it's about everybody. It's not about my journey. Yeah. Because if nobody's interested in the monastery in England, that's fine, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to go back to a warm country and 600 acres of forest. Mm -hmm. But it seems that people are quite interested, so yeah. as long as they are, <laughs> I'll keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you... Um in silence mostly, like when you're walking the nine miles and you're like in your eating your food afterwards and um, it really depends on the situation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Certainly in designated retreat time we're always in silence. Uh -huh. And at the monastery we would always eat in silence. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm on arms round then normally I would stand in silence mm -hmm. and after that I would say that I'd eat fairly quietly because I'd be probably quite moved by the whole thing, you know? And that way would feel like just being more present with the food and, and really receiving it with a lot of gratitude. Mm -hmm. But if there's somebody with me who wants to talk or, you know, it feels appropriate, then I will. Okay. So if I'm with a friend and they take me out for lunch, I feel it would be, I don't know, Unless they sort of specifically said, I'd like to eat in silence, I would feel that I'd just be available, you know, if they wanted to talk or just flexible to the situation. So I think that's important, actually, because sometimes people can get a bit too, you know, making rules out of things uh -huh. and making shoulds and should nots out of things that, yeah, really need to be adapted to the situation. Yeah, yeah. But generally, yeah, it's a contemplative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak a little bit to the balance between um, kind of, I, well in my own terms I feel like I'm sometimes seeking and searching something different than what I grew up with or what I have found yet. Mm -hmm. or that's, you know, being yeah. here and, and yeah. sort of past. So the balance between that sense of seeking with also maybe finding peace with what you have right. in the present and where yeah. the past kind of, uh -huh. what the past speaks to and okay. to those things. That's really, really interesting, yeah. It's a constant sort of, um, I think it's something you have to constantly sort of balance actually. Because like you say, you know, if we're looking too far ahead into what we're after, we can lose what we have now. Um, but I think for me it's been a matter of keeping open, just re remaining very open. And I guess without it sounding too sort of, um, I don't know, new agey, I have always tended to feel that there are certain signs in my life that are bringing me towards something. So I tend to have a certain sense that, oh, maybe my practice needs to be a bit kinder and then I'll have my ears and eyes and senses open to anything that resonates with that. <coughs> So, for example, I was feeling that way in Burma, you know, that maybe the practice was a bit too driven and we were being asked to sit longer and longer hours and it just felt like, hmm, I'm moving away from that somehow. So I stayed with the feeling, like I stayed with it, I didn't leave immediately into something I wasn't sure of, but at the same time I was kind of, I felt an opening happening within myself that perhaps it's time to, some kind of inner shift. And then I think when that shift sort of starts to manifest more within myself, things tend to come along. So at that time Ajahn Brahm came along, the talks came along, and I listened to them and I was sort of pretty sure that I want to follow that lead. But I still stayed for another few months and um, I sort of did a little bit of, 
you know, looking him up on, on the internet and finding out about his background and where he's teaching and that kind of thing. And then I kept meeting people who knew him and sort of validating what I already felt, you know, that he really does have very deep experience in meditation and, um, yeah, I heard more about the monastery, this kind of thing. So it started to be very clear to me. And then when I did leave, it just so happened that there was a retreat with, a retreat with him fairly soon afterwards. And, uh, yeah, so I kind of listened to that, um, but didn't make a, a quick decision either. Um, I guess I have a very strong sense that we do find what we need on the path if we're open and receptive. That's how it's been for me. And, you know, for the last few years I've been feeling quite stuck, actually, in, in Perth, even though, I, in theory, I was in the perfect place. I'd looked forward to being there, I'd done everything I could to be there, and yet something wasn't quite working for me. And uh, there was a lot of doubt. There was a lot of sense of, am I in the wrong place? Is it even the right path for me anymore, you know? Um, but I think the practice helped me to stay with those feelings of doubt until something else came along, and that something else was my teacher saying, why didn't you go to England? So as soon as he said that, it was like, yes, you know, that's, that's the next thing. So I didn't push it. I think it's important not to make decisions when, you're, um, when there are, is a lot of doubt, because the mind's not clear enough sometimes at that point. Um, but yeah, I think the path involves a lot of trust in the process. And I think the fact that you are sort of wanting that deeper meaning or that sense of a more personalised or a path that's really right for you is the start of finding it, actually. I think, yeah, I think it's good to have that. I don't think it's the same as craving for, for something. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Can I have one more question? Yeah, sure. But I might be formulating it as it comes out. But my friend and I were talking about like our own aversions to organized religion. Yeah. And how they can be kind of oppressive and yeah. um, in the way that the teachings come across, it's almost like oh, we have all the answers, like, these are the answers. Yeah. And <clears throat> and then we were, like, talking that uh, about that in relation to, like, science and, like, research and how, like, in science it's, like, the exact opposite of that. There's always, like, this forward progression and this acceptance that we don't know it all, but that's why we're going to continue to, like, right. move forward and evolve yeah. and try to... Yeah move further in our understanding of the world. And so I was just wondering what your views were on like the relationship like Buddhism has to like mm -hmm. those two different mm -hmm. spheres. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean I kind of feel like it lies in the center, but I don't know if yeah. you could just speak to that. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And one of the things that I always used to convince my mother of when I started to practice was that this is not religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I think one of the hardest things for her when I ordained um, um this is my idea, I haven't asked her, um, was that suddenly I looked like I was part of a religion and it was like, huh, you said it wasn't and now, why do you look like that? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I feel the same, like, I feel also like, uh, like I said before, for me it's not about a religion, it's about a lifestyle, so yeah. it's about the homeless life, the, the renunciant's life, and in ancient India that was understood, mm -hmm. so you weren't part of a religion, you're actually going against the religions of those days. Mm -hmm. So the other religions, what do they call them? There were other names for all the other, they basically call them the sectarians. Again and again in the suttas it talks about the sectarians, you know, and they're from different religions. And the monastics were called the samanas, which meant those who've gone forth out of religion, out of everything, out of the home. Basically wayfarers, seekers, spiritual mm -hmm. seekers. So I think... Um, yeah, the way a religion's interpreted always depends on the people's understanding. And within any religion, you'll have some people who say it is a religion, and some people who say it isn't a religion, it's a way of life, it's an experiment, it's whatever. I tend to be on that side, and I tend to think of um, the Buddha's teaching as more like a series of experiments that you do, a mental experiments, or experiments for purification of the mind, or experiments mm -hmm. for ending suffering. 
I think of it that way because it's an experiential path. Yeah. And the Buddha himself said, you know, don't believe anything because you've been told that by your teachers or because it agrees with previously held beliefs or because out of tradition, out of respect for the tradition, not even because he says so. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that really stands out to me from other religions, yeah. because the Buddha himself is saying, don't believe it because I say so. <clears throat> so he didn't care about having disciples. He didn't want to get people to convert to anything. Mm -hmm. He just wanted us to find out for ourselves. So he said, only when you know for yourself that this is true, this is beneficial, then you can take it as the Dhamma. But he never said as Buddhism. There wasn't a word Buddhism in the whole Pali Canon. There's no word Buddhism. There's only Dhamma, which means teachings or law of nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're angry, it's going to cause suffering. If you develop contentment, letting go, kindness, it's going to lead to peace. That's Dhamma. That's not religion. And that applies to any religion, right? No matter if you're Christian, Muslim, whatever, that's going to be the same. <laughs> So I don't think of Buddhism as a religion, but my teacher says it's a religion for tax purposes. <laughs> 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 Which is kind of interesting. <laughs> and now we're applying, you know, for charitable status in England for our organisation. And, you know, if we didn't call it Buddhism, we wouldn't be able to get recognised as a religious organisation. So we have to use that, you know, framework of religious charity. Um, but... I think if anybody starts telling you, oh, you've got to believe this to be a Buddhist, then they don't really understand what they're talking about, to be <laughs> honest. But I think it's good to have an open mind. So there are key tenets of Buddhism, right? There are key kind of, um, I wouldn't call them views, but they're experiences that the Buddha had. So, for example, he talked about karma. He taught that there's a, a, a cause and a result of everything, to everything. So any action, especially any intention that we have, it has an effect. So you could call that a belief, but to me it's more something he discovered and something I might not understand now, or I may understand to a certain level, but I have to remain open to it if I'm really going to learn, or if I'm going to be open enough to learn from his teachings. Mm -hmm. At least there should be a kind of, oh, let me see if that's true, let me see, you know, let me see how that works out in my life, if it's helpful or not, rather than I don't believe that because I don't want to be a... Buddhist, or I don't, you know, mm -hmm. then it's another kind of dogmatism. Mm -hmm. So, and as far as science goes, I think, you, again, you get good scientists, bad scientists. You'll get scientists that are dogmatic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll get scientists that say, we did this experiment with this medicine in this disease, and these are the facts. Forget about the fact that they were funded by a drug company who's trying to sell that medicine, mm -hmm. or forget about the fact that there's ten other studies to disprove it, or studies that show the opposite, because there are, actually. <laughs> um, so even in science there can be dogmatism. And Ajahn Brahm always says that the, the uh, level of evidence they need in science to prove something like reincarnation is so much higher, they make the level of evidence required so much higher than they do for things that they want to believe. Mm -hmm. because there is evidence for reincarnation or rebirth lots of it you know but yeah they say oh yeah no that can be explained other ways but they can't disprove it either so some things you can't actually prove or disprove using scientific methods but um, I think the important thing is to remain open and to find out for oneself and to me that's what the practice is you know it's like looking at okay how does this particular mental attitude or uh, way I relate to something, how does it affect me? And does it lead to my good and the good of others? So they're kind of the yardsticks, really, mm -hmm. to measure things by. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so... I've been told that I can talk all day, so, <laughs> but I won't. <laughs>